Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here on this uh, beautiful <laughs> President's Day at 9 a.m. Uh, so we can talk about cool class stuff. Yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> okay. Um, so I won't take an informal poll of raising hands, but I want you to do a little self-check of A, have I read through Project 3 description, and B, have I started on Project 3? So if the answer to both those is no, then you're definitely behind. So you should get started like right after this class or whenever you can after this class, depending on your schedule. <coughs> um, so I'll take the first maybe like 15 minutes of class today to go over Project 3 so we can talk about it, so we can make sure that everybody knows what's supposed to happen, what the project is supposed to look like. Um, and that's basically the idea here. Uh, and so if you have started or you have read it, you can feel free to take this time to ask any questions and we can kind of answer any questions that come up here. Okay, so high level idea of this project, you're going to write in using either C or C++, your choice, you have to write completely from scratch a program that reads in a description of a context-free grammar and depending on what arguments you pass it, does some type of computation or output some information about that context-free grammar. Um, so one of the things you'll either do output the first sets or output follow sets. So you'll actually be programming the algorithm to calculate first and follow sets on an arbitrary context-free grammar. Um, and there's a like a small step task is zero, which just outputs some information about the grammar. So kind of, it's this project is designed in a way for you to build up from task zero, which is just make sure you're reading the input and being able to output things correctly, to task one and task two, which task one is calculating first sets and task two is calculating follow sets. To, so to calculate follow sets, what do you have to have? First sets, yeah, right? So that's kind of, that's kind of the way how I would break this problem down and approach this, right? Is, Okay, do this first task by task zero, make sure that's working 100%, then do task one, make sure that's working 100%, and then build on that to the follow tasks. Uh, questions at a high level? High level kind of project goals, yeah? When you say task zero, are you literally just like, typing in zero, like in the... In no. The, or is that, because I, 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 yeah. Right. No. We'll get to that in a second, but yes. <laughs> okay. uh, I guess literally typing in before you run the command, yes but not typing in as input to the program. We'll see. Right. Any other questions, title? Yeah? What kind of data structures do you recommend for this project? Uh, that's a very good question. Let's talk about that when we get closer and get more into the details. Because yeah, that's a good, uh, good question. All right. So first thing we need to do is figure out how do we decide what tasks to run if we're doing task 0, task 1, or task 2. So this is a little snippet of C code that you are free to use uh, that shows you how to read command line arguments that are passed into a program. So what are command line arguments? <coughs> Not standard in. Arguments you take in from the command line. Yeah, so that's the difference, right? So if we look at, um, let's see, where do I have it here? All right, so if I run some kind of thing here, uh, I guess I actually don't have anything. So if I'm going to run this command, right, test one, whatever, whatever, anything I pass in here, uh, right, these are all arguments to the command line, right? So these arguments are going to be passed into the program, technically by the shell bash, but the specifics, you probably don't have to worry about now, but it is, uh, it is very cool. Can y'all see that, or should I make it bigger or change the lighting? Whereas if I run the thing like this, and see there's nothing here. Um, when I'm running a command like let's say cat, right? this is standard input. So I'm giving standard input to the program, and it's reading from standard input and outputting to standard out. So this is basically the two ways you can get input to a program. Right? You can use a command line argument, you use standard input, yeah. Can you say what cat does again? Oh, cat just uh, outputs. Uh, by default, it reads from standard in and outputs whatever it gets to standard out. Otherwise, if you give it a file name, like if I did test one, it would <coughs> output, it would take in that file name and output that. So it concatenates several files together. So if you wanted to do 
several files that will concatenate, concatenate them all together. Um, but I'm just using it for the standard input, standard output. Okay. Let's go back here. Okay, so when you're when um, when arguments are passed to your program, right? How do you know that arguments are passed to your pro your C or C++ program? Yeah, how handled in the main. So how does your commands are stored in an array? Yeah, so the basic idea is argc here, the first int argument to main, specifies how many arguments you have. And then argv, right, this is a char star star, right? The other brackets mean that it's an array of character star pointers, or character star, which are character pointers. Right, so it's an array of pointers to strings. And argc tells you how many in that array there are. Right? So, uh, ah, yes, okay. So, yes? Uh, just a question on that, like for a while. So, sure. um, is it just convention to use argc and argv as yes. a name, or can you use anything else? Yeah, the names don't matter to, okay. it depends on your code in here. Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. Just okay. the signature matters. You mess up the signature, you'll get past integers and <coughs> car star stars. But okay. yeah, we'll be passing multiple uh, zero one two parameters in the RV character array. No, so just one. So yeah, I, I think we'll see an example in a second. Uh, so the idea is argc tells us how many parameters were passed to our program. Uh, so what we do is we first check if argc is less than two. Then it says that we're missing an argument. Why less than two? How many parameters did I say we were passing? Two. Two. Well, one of them is the name of. Let me try and find it. I guess I don't have. What do I? Ah, there we go. Yeah, so if we're going to run it like this, right, with zero saying we want to do task zero, how many arguments am I passing to a dot out here? One, two. 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 One. So yes, so technically we are only passing one argument, right? We're passing the argument zero to a dot out. <laughs> but the way this argv and argc works, argv zero is the name of the program being executed, right? So in this case, it would be, sorry, I should put these closer. A dot out? Yeah, in this case, it would be the string a dot out, <laughs> right? Which actually is useful, could be useful to your program if your program maybe changes its execution depending on how it's being called. So argv0 is always the name of your program. And so if there is a command line argument, argv1 is going to be the first argument, and argv2 will be the second, argv3 <coughs> will be the third. Um, so this is why here, argc will probably always be one uh, if you don't pass anything in. And so this is checking if argc is less than two, which means we did not pass an argument. Uh, it's going to say, hey, you're missing an argument, and we're going to exit early, right, because we don't want to do anything. And the next line is, yeah, so we kind of have a note here to mention this. Are we going to be receiving, like, are any of the test cases something where that's going to be? No. Okay. No, you don't have to worry about that. Um, you don't have to worry about any garbage RVs. Uh, and you can follow the input here. It'll actually follow really closely. Okay, so RV1 is the task, right? But it's a char star, right? It's a pointer to a string, or it's a pointer to a character array. Right? So we use the ATOI with the ATOI function stand for? ASCII to integer. Yeah, so it takes in a uh, <coughs> pair star and returns the integer that that represents. Um, so we set that to be task, which we define it here as an integer. And then we do a simple switch statement and say, hey, if it's task 0, then do task 0. If it's task 1, then calculate the first sets and output the first sets. And if it's case 2, you, you don't. Uh, out, calculate first sets, calculate follow sets, then output the follow sets. Uh, otherwise, then output say, hey, I didn't recognize this number, and break to return. <coughs> so you don't have to follow this exactly. I don't really care. Uh, you know, it's just got to work. But a thing to note, right, you should probably not do your entire first set calculations right here in the main function. 
because you know that you're going to have to do them later if it's case two, right? So you want to make sure that you know that you have a function of how to calculate first sets, right? Okay. Questions on just on reading the the task number? <coughs> All right, so this is the part that I really like. So we're describing the input to your program with a grammar, and the input to your program is a grammar, right? Is a context-free grammar, and it's specified using a context-free grammar. Uh, at high level, we have different sections, each separated by uh, the hash symbol. Uh, the grammar specification, when it's all done, is terminated by double hash. Um, so this means that if there are any symbols after the double hash, they're ignored, right? You keep reading until you get to the double hash, and you know you're done. You don't have to read anymore. Um, all the symbols are white space separated, so this is specified in here. And so our description of the grammar in a context-free grammar, so we start with S, we have a non-terminal list, followed by a rule list, followed by a double hash, right, at a high level. And we say a non-terminal list is followed by an ID list, is an ID list followed by a hash, where an ID list is a series of IDs, uh, which we specify our tokens here, IDs, hashes, double hashes, and arrows. Um, then a rule list is rules, where each rule is an ID with an arrow with the right-hand side, where the right-hand side is an ID list, or epsilon nothing. So putting that all together, and so we have all the tokens described here. So when, and this basically specifies exactly what we mean by white space, right? So that way we're all, we all know what we mean by white space. So it's the is space function in ctypes.h, right? So if you ever want to know, hey, is this a white space character, you call this function, it'll return one if it's a white space character, or zero if it's not, yeah? So for, we had to modify, or we can modify lexer.h and lexer.c for hash, double hash, and uh, the arrow. Yes. But we don't have to do Uh, that's what you have to absolutely make sure of. Okay. <coughs> yes. Uh, I, off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure it does do this, but like this is the same. Uh, but I don't know 100%. So yeah, that's you can definitely use lexer.h and lexer.c, and it's a good exercise. But you can't just drop it in. You have to modify it and change it um, because there's a lot more tokens in lexer.c than there are in this language. Right? There's a token for if, there's a token for while, there's a token for all these other things. Uh, when here we only have really five tokens. A digit, uh, ID, hash, double hash, and error. So you can do that, or you can code this by hand. You can write your own lexer here. And our, in, uh, I think on the input, are there going to be, there, there's <coughs> the sample input that's lower down. Mm -hmm. There are like examples where you use like colon, I think, or comma. Mm -hmm. are, those, are those part of ID, or are those actual these are the only, so these are the only tokens in our input language. Okay. That's it. Okay. Full stop. These are the tokens. Plus letter and digit. Huh? Plus letter and digit. Uh, plus letter and digit, yes. But they're not ever used in here. Right. So. Okay. There's like some tokens. Exactly, yes. Yes. All right. Okay, so, right, this describes what it means to be part of our input language, right? How do we read input? The semantics says, what does it actually mean, right? What does that, that actually mean in our program? Um, so the idea is we first have this list of all of the non-terminals in our language, right? So we say in this first list, which is an ID list up to uh, hash, uh, each of these IDs is a non-terminal in our input language. Uh, I believe we say here that the very first one is the starting non-terminal. Right. Yeah, the first non-terminal in this list is the start symbol of the grammar. Right. So we read in all the, the terminals. So what does that mean? So next you're reading the rules. So what happens if you see something that's not in this list? Error. The terminal, yeah. If it's, if it's on the right-hand side, it's got to be a terminal. If it's on the left-hand side, then you would have an error, but... I am 99% sure we have no test. Like we're not, 
Uh, this isn't an error checking assignment. This is we give you valid input and we expect the correct output. So that on its own is difficult enough. So uh, you should, you gotta be prepared for that. Uh, okay, so this is saying I have this <coughs> non-terminal <laughs> declaration, ID list one, ID list. And so then for each of these hashes, uh, up to the hash is a rule where I have an ID, which is the left-hand side of the rule, an arrow, and then everything after the arrow is the right-hand side of the symbols of the grammar, right? So you can easily see how this, or you can see how this could be a grammar, right? You have declaration goes to an ID list, followed by a colon, followed by a capital ID, right? So is this capital ID the token ID in our language? It's just an actual terminal in the input language, right? It doesn't mean anything to us. It just means something to this specific language. Yeah. Uh, this idealist one here is interesting. So what does this mean? <coughs> epsilon. epsilon. Yeah, exactly. So this is the special case for idealist one goes to epsilon, right? So there's nothing here. Yeah, so the first section sets all the non-terminals, and the rest of the input specifies all the, gr all the grammar rules. So this is how that would be represented in how we've been seeing context-free grammars, right? So it's saying like, okay, we have a declaration, goes to an ID list, colon ID, ID list is ID, ID list one, yeah. Combo isn't shown as the token used in the grammar descriptions. Should we add it? This? Yeah. How do you know that? So what do you know when you see this token? Or when you read this? What's this gonna read as from the lexer? An ID. It's an ID with the name of comma all uppercase. Right? So in this language that we're reading in, what do we know about comma? It's a symbol, but what is it? What kind of symbol is it? The terminal? The terminal? How do you know? Because it's on the right hand side of an arrow. That isn't one of the what about this? Is this a terminal? Sits on the right hand side of an arrow? It's a, term, it's, it's a word that's not in that first list. Yes. It's an ID, and it's not in this first list, which means it must be a terminal. So this has, once again, this has nothing to do with our input tokens. Right? Our input tokens say, how do we read this? Right? This is going to read this as um, whatever ID list, but it's going to be ID, 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 hash, ID, arrow, ID, 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 hash, ID, hat, arrow, ID, ID, hash. So how does the grammar description relate to the input grammar exactly? Like, can't you like parse that whole thing We're without? Using grammar to define grammar. Yes. Like, to define. We're using uh, this grammar to define how to read in an input grammar. <laughs> well, it's using its definition to define itself. Yes. It's supposed to make you think. <laughs> you should be able to feed in basically this grammar to get the first and follow set of this grammar. <laughs> right. But to your program, it doesn't matter at all. Right. Your program just reads that in. And it knows what each of these symbols means, and it knows how to build up the rules of the context-free grammar. Right? But the input language is never going to change. Right? Like what your lexer considers as an ID, a hash, a double hash, and an arrow is never going to change. And what your grammar parses as this, right? This input language is never going to change. you got to take it back to the semantics here. Uh, this is a rule list. Okay. Uh, so a rule list ends with a hash. Okay. Right? So this rule list is going to end with a hash, and then there'll be a double hash after it. Okay. That's how you know. That double hash is how you know there's no more rules. No more rules okay. Exactly. Because each rule is rule, which is ID, arrow, right-hand side, hash. So you have as many of those as possible until you get to a double hash. copy of ID list one, uh, the first one after, like a copy the of the fourth line after the fifth line. You would <coughs> just ignore it. You would have already ended the file, right? Yes. If there's anything after here, you don't care. Just like on project two, when you looped until the lexer returned to end of file, this you're kind of looping until you get to double hash, and then you just stop. You don't have to read any more input. You don't care if there's errors or junk afterwards. You don't care if it's the end of file afterwards. If there's other stuff, you just stop reading because that's what the input specification says. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and the, hash, and the, the, the single hashes are like basically new lines, kind of. Kind of, yes. They are separating these different parts. Because you technically have this all in one line then, because of the way it reads it. Yes. Like that. <laughs> right, so it says like even, so that on the, that example, just for readability purposes, they're separated on new lines, right? But new line is just white space, right? And white space is ignored, like all the tokens are separated by white space. So they could be all on one line, they could be separated by multiple new lines. The input could definitely look like this. Yes. Uh, great, so then we can tell from, uh, and uh, everything is case sensitive, right? That's the important thing. Um, so we know the non-terminals from our first section of our input, and then we know all of the terminals based on things that were used on the right-hand side of rules that are not known non-terminals. So we're kind of doing an implicit declaration here of the non-terminals. Okay, questions on the input? So as you can see, the spec is you know, complicated. So you should read through it several times to make sure you fully understand in your brain how the input should be coming in, right? Um, and then that way, that helps you code it, right? Because it's a lot easier to change your code before you've written it, right? And so if it's something that like, hey, I don't know, case sensitivity, right, or something like that. You want to make sure you know all these properties of the input. Okay, uh, just like before, CentOS 6.7, everything. Um, this is where, yeah, we kind of reiterate again, you can use, you're welcome to use lexer.c or lexer.h, but you have to, you have to modify them. Just try to drop it in, it's not gonna work, it's gonna cause problems. You're gonna be an unhappy student. Okay. Yes. If we do use those, do you we have to keep the name Lexer.h? No, no. no. Or do we change that? As long as. Whatever you want. We can tell what, where the code came from. <coughs> the only time that would ever come up is if it matched somebody else's code. But doesn't the, um, the submissions, the submission set would then use those files? No. Like you, it will compile it all just as if it was your source code. So this is, basically what this says is uh, we're not going to automatically add any source code. Like last time we added Lexer.c and Lexer.h. Right, so now you're basically submitting an entire, an entire program. It's got to be written to these specifications, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So, okay. so we just have to upload those two other files. Yes. That we're gonna use. Yeah. Oh. That's why they can be named whatever you want. All right. So briefly going over the tasks. Uh, task zero. The goal is you're just going to get some information about your grammar. Um, so the idea is you're going to list first all of the terminals uh, of the grammar separated by a space uh, in the order they appear. Let's see, in the order they appear in the output grammar or the input grammar, right? So this is all of the terminals. So how do we tell if things are a terminal? It's on the right hand side of an arrow, and it is not in the first line of the input. Right? Yes. Exactly. It's not a non-terminal, so it's a terminal, and it's on the right-hand side of the list. Yeah. I'm assuming, I'm assuming like all the other questions we've done, this is all like directly from standard input. Yes. Yeah. Just like this, so your lecture has to read from standard input, just like the other. I think it says it in here that it's coming from the input's coming from standard input, and then you'll output the standard output. Um, yes. Okay. So this would be the order that it appears, right? So if we look at not that one, because that's really annoying. Okay. So if we look at here. We can see, okay, ID list is a terminal. I know because it's here. Colon is not a terminal, or it's not a non-terminal because it's not here. So I know that it's a terminal. So that's the first one that appears in the list, right? Like left to right, top to bottom as you read it in. Um, ID would be the second terminal in this list, right? Because it's not in here. And then ID, I've already read, ID list two. And comma would be the third one that I've read in. Uh, so it should be if we go down. Should be colon, ID, comma. Right? So those are the three that I read in order. Uh, then you're going to output for each non-terminal in the input grammar uh, in the order they appear in the first section. Right. So another thing. Uh, it's going to be, you're going to output the non-terminal <coughs> followed by a colon character, followed by the number of rules in which the non-terminal appears on the left-hand side. This is written a little unclear. Uh, pretty clear to look at it, though. So basically, this is how many rules are there, are there for declaration? How many rules are there for ID list one? How many rules are there for ID list two? So if we see, so 
ordered because we have decal, ID list one, ID list two. And we can see that there's one rule here for ID decal, one rule for ID list, two for ID list two. And that's just what we're outputting. Uh, so the goal here is to get you to read in the input grammar. Right? So you should be thinking about how do I want to represent a context-free grammar as a data structure? Right? Uh, how do I want to represent uh, the non-terminals, the terminals? How do I want to represent the rules as a data structure? Right? So I can iterate over them, so I can compute on them. Okay, and I'll briefly go over the other ones so we can have some time to talk about the uh, data structures. Uh, the next one is just first sets. So uh, I'm going to basically let you read through this, but the idea is you output uh, for each symbol of the grammar what the first set is, and we specify exactly how to uh, determine the first sets. So it's going to be uh, if epsilon is in the set, we're going to represent it as a hash. If it is in the set, it should be listed before any other elements. Uh, <coughs> otherwise, it needs to be sorted using the string comp, strcmp function from string.h. Um, uh, so running that on the previous program <coughs> should give an output like this. The first of decal is an ID. The first of ID list one is epsilon comma, and the first of ID list is an ID. And then the second one is follow set. So it's the same uh, basically output order. It's just end of file we're representing as a dollar sign. And if end of file is on in the set, it's listed first. Otherwise, everything else is sorted. The output basically looks like this. Questions on first and follow? So this is where the meat of it is. But the output specification is pretty um, you know, well defined. It's actually doing it. Evaluation, so uh, task of zero is 20 points. Uh, first sets without epsilon are 30 points. Uh, first sets with epsilon, 20 points. Follow sets for grammars without epsilon, 25 points. Follow sets for grammars with epsilon, 10 points. Uh, important point, this is how we've been doing this entire class, right? Just like a compiler, if your output doesn't exactly match the expected output, then you fail that test case. Right? It doesn't matter that there are spaces here or not spaces here or there's an extra comma or not an extra comma. Uh, it needs to be exactly and precisely matched the expected output. Um, and then for, so you can look in the .zip file. I think I'm here. Uh, tests. So we've given you test cases from every category in there. And these are test cases that are on the submissions server. Uh, so when you run these outputs, it basically will say, so if I cat tests, uh, test 01 dot, let's see, text. So we can see if this was our input language and we ran it with uh, the zero option, we would expect this output. And then for first sets, these are the first sets of that grammar and the false sets of that grammar. And there's a, I highly, highly, highly recommend uh, that you use the, this test one dot underscore p3 dot sh. Uh, so this is the, a shell script that will run all these test cases against your submission or your uh, compiled program and it'll tell you exactly how many passed. The reason why this is important is this is the exact same way we're running and comparing your test cases on the server. So if you run this on set OS 6.7 and it says you're passing eight test cases, you should, unless you're doing something wrong, you should pass eight test cases on the, a minimum of eight test cases on the server. And that's just in the zip file? Yes. It's on the submission site. Yeah. Uh, the last project, I was, I spent hours trying to figure out why I couldn't pass some of the secret test cases and one of the reasons being is that I was Yeah, I mean, so part 
part of that is it goes back to really understanding what exactly is this asking you to do and what is it not asking you to do. Right? So for project two, I'd say, well, it doesn't say to stop. It says to keep reading until you get an end of file token. Right? So um, I guess for like cases where um, So, um, okay, a couple bits. I think generally, right, so at a high level, <coughs> you can actually use this same testing infrastructure to write your own test cases. So that's something I think would be very helpful, is you can add uh, more tests into tests if you just uh, create test, I don't know, 07.txt, right, and have your, your <coughs> expected you write by hand, expected zero, expected one, expected two, and then you run it or you run it and you test your program, right? Then you can make sure that what how you think the program should output is actually what it outputs, right? So that can help with things like uh, it's part of learning how to test your code, right? So uh, you know what are all the error conditions? Like what? Um, like okay, I'm checking if uh, there's good input. But what about if there's bad input? I mean, in this case, we're telling you, okay, you don't have to worry too much about bad input, but um, yeah, what if there's a token that is a number? Right? Well, in this language, there is no token num, so it shouldn't change anything, but maybe if you're using the lexer and you never remove that part, it's going to mess up. Or um, what happens if there's no input? Or what happens if there's uh, long rules? Right? Did you hard, is there anything hard-coded? Did you hard-code any lengths or numbers of things? Right? That could be another thing that happens. Um, uh, so that's generally... Uh, I think always a good idea is to make your own <coughs> test cases. And you can take the, you know, the grammars we've been using in class or something and make test cases out of those. Um, especially for first and follow, if you make a grammar with kind of like a loop, maybe, or what looks like a loop, um, you know, to make sure your program doesn't crash on that. Uh, those are all good, good techniques. Uh, what was the other part of your question? You were looking for, oh, oh. Yeah, I guess um, it's the, I guess it's the question of program answer. Right. Like, I guess I even made my own test cases, and I was like, I still cannot find where I'm. Well, that's how you learn. That right. Helps, no. Which doesn't help. Uh, <laughs> doesn't help you in that scenario. Builds uh, character. <laughs> I feel like a dad when I say that. Um, right. <laughs> okay, so one thing, I, like a very good technique that I actually really like using is to kind of what they say, code defensively. So, uh, for instance, uh, using assert statements to assert things that you know should be true in your program, right? So like, uh, if you're writing a function to calculate first and follow sets, right, and you are using uh, a string for the left-hand side rule or something, and you are asserting that, hey, this left-hand side rule should never be null, right? Uh, one of the worst parts about an error is if it never manifests itself, right, and it just continues to work incorrectly. With an assert statement, an assert statement um, basically runs whatever's in this expression and will kill the program and output an error if this is ever false. So you can write statements in your code that say, hey, I expect this pointer to never be null. And I expect this data structure, the length of this data structure to always be greater than one. And if that's ever not the case, it'll stop and it'll, it'll tell you, right, rather than just failing incorrectly. Um, so this is kind of about putting your assumptions directly in the code. Like here you can, yeah, so this is asserting that this, this is never gonna be null. So this is kind of a technique called essentially defensive programming, right? So you put in all your assumptions and then you tell the program, hey, if these assumptions are ever not true, break, because I don't know what should happen then. Um, that's kind of a, a high level. And I think the other way to think about it is, uh, what's always helpful to me, I don't know, what your guys' approach is, but uh, for me, not necessarily writing out the code, but writing out the steps of the algorithm and maybe the data structures, it's a lot easier to change something that's on like pencil and paper rather than in your editor and it has to compile and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, walking through your code step by step and being like, okay, what's actually happening here? Why is it, why is it going wrong? All right. Well,
let's kind of talk at a high level about what, what kind of things do we want to read in in this project. What's our goal? We do have like all these tokens, but you want to read them in <coughs> kind of grouped in certain things like the right hand side. Or right, so at, at a high level, like what's the high, what's the high level, what are we trying to read in? Sequence of tokens. Uh, higher, higher level. A sequence of characters. No, higher, that's lower. <laughs> higher, group the, group the things Context together. Free Context free grammar, right? Yeah, the, the high level, right? <laughs> More abstractly. You're going, you're going too deep. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so right, at a high level we want a context free grammar, right? So this is kind of the way I approach these problems is thinking about it in terms of data structure. Right, so it's like if I'm reading in a context-free grammar, well, then I probably want some kind of data structure to contain a context-free grammar. Right, I want some code representation of what is a what do I think a context-free grammar is. So that's kind of hard. There's a lot of parts here. Right, I mean, so like, what kind of things are in a context-free grammar? And let's I'll get rid of this because I don't want to talk about any code stuff. What are parts of a context-free grammar? The non-terminals? So that's a specific rule, right? High level. What's what is a context free grammar? Yeah, the non-terminals, right? Uh, what else? Terminals. Terminals. What else? Epsilon. <coughs> Epsilon? Yeah. I guess we can kind of put that in with terminals, but yeah. It's good to think about all these things. What else? What else makes up a context for grammar? Or. What was that? Or. Or in what sense? Um, <coughs> I guess different paths. That ah, so we can have, so that kind of shows us that there can be multiple rules, right? We can have multiple rules of a left-hand side rule. Yeah. What is the direct? I said arrows. Said that. Arrows, a higher level, like uh, abstractly, right? We, don't, we know that there are these symbols, right? We know that there are these symbols, but at a high level, they don't mean anything besides telling the program, hey, this is, the arrow separates the left-hand side from the right-hand side, right? And the or means that there are separate rules, right? But at a high level, what really constitutes, so are all of these non-terminals exactly the same according to our context-free grammar? No. no. Is one more special than the others? The starting non -terminal. Yeah, so we need to know which one's the starting, right? Why do we need to know that? It is where you start, but why for what we want to do, why does it matter? Because it's going to be the first one in that, in that initial list. Uh, yes, that's how we're going to know it's the starting non-terminal. But why is that important, right? So we want to think in two different ways. We want to think about what is a context-free grammar, and what am I using this data structure for, right? Because if I never am going to need the starting non-terminal, then it doesn't make sense to well, read it in. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you start with the things that we went over on each of the projects, and then the things that we learned, Yeah, we at, so for first we don't need the starting non terminal, but absolutely for the, follow, yeah, for, the follow. for the follow sets we need the starting non terminal, right? So we need to know where to place uh, the end of file in there, right? Uh, so we definitely need that. So what else? What are what are the main things? So this tells you, okay, my non terminals, my terminals, I have epsilon, I know my starting non terminal. <coughs> what am I missing here from context free grammars? So if I gave you a data structure containing all this information, could you calculate first and follow sets? Why or why not? Yeah. End of file. Yeah. Huh? Need your rules. Yeah, we need rules, right? Right. Without rules, we don't. Our context-free grammar is just a set of non-terminals and terminals, right? just nothing without the rules. So what's a rule? A rule is a non-terminal on the left followed by a terminal with a non-terminal on the right. Right. So but what are the important what are the important bits in there? The the terminals and non-terminals on the right find the non-terminal. Right, 
so we have like a right hand side, right, which we'll put here as kind of like a list of uh, terminals. And then what do we also have? Left. Left hand side. So what's the type of the left hand side? Just a non-terminal. Right, just a non-terminal. Right, so remember what I was saying about asserts? Right? When we create a rule, we would probably maybe want to put in a assert that says, hey, the left hand side has to always be a non-terminal. Right? If it's ever the case that I'm reading in a rule or I've created this rule and the left hand side is a terminal, something's gone horribly wrong. So I should kill the program. Because nothing I do after that makes sense. For the sake of this project, would you suggest using a service? Uh, yes. I think it's something that's pretty cheap and easy to do and helps you think about what assumptions you're making in your code. I think that helps a lot. Um, OK. So non-terminals, terminals, epsilon. So OK, so we've kind of done this. Um, you know, How we want to represent these things are kind of so think about it in terms of data structures. This non-terminals and this terminals, does order matter here? Yes. Yes. Yes? Well, Why? Well, it wouldn't have the right hand side, you know. Ah, sorry. In the context free grammar, the non-terminals and terminals, does order matter? Because if we try to find, uh, at least it's my understanding, because if we have, the way that we define non-terminals is there things on the right-hand side mm -hmm. that are not in the list of terminals. Flip it around. So yes. But we find terminals as things that are not yeah, in the list yes, of non-terminals yes. that are on the right-hand side. So Correct. we need to have that, we need to have the list of non-terminals before the list of terminals, because otherwise it becomes ambiguous. Maybe not. So yes. Well, okay, yeah. Since we're keeping track of what the starting non terminal is, the order of the rest of them is, should be trivial. Or it doesn't matter. Right. Right? Yeah. So that so you can think about so what kind of uh, different data structures or data types thinking about it a little abstractly, right? Yeah, right. So a set you can make sets all over the place. So having a set just for set, yeah, right. So these could be sets because the order of them doesn't matter. Right. But now when we go down here to the right hand side, can these be sets? No. Doesn't Why? Because they, they have a particular order. order. Yes. Right. An A followed by a B is not the same as a B followed by a B. Right. So if we have A goes to little a, big A, right? And we have A goes to little b, big, uh, little a, right? Those are two complete, like the order of the right hand side here really matters. Right? It's actually critical to our understanding and interpreting this rule of what to do. Um, so yeah, so something like a list makes sense here. So now let's think about how do we want to represent terminals and non-terminals? What can we do? Terminals and non-terminals, where they're all just symbols, right? Either terminals, non-terminals. Yeah. Did you just have a linked list with the starting uh, point? Of every linked list, the non-terminal. A uh, linked list to what? The it, I mean, you have your non-terminals, your starting point, link every linked list. So if you have like S, A, B, Big B on the left-hand side. Those are all linked lists in an array of linked lists. So this. Oh, no, no, those are like all separate rules. Like S goes to A. Oh, oh sorry. This is my link. Even more basic, right? How do I know? So I'm, I get in an ID. How do I tell if that ID matches like my non-terminals or terminals? Or could you check if it's in the, the set of non-terminals? Right. But how do I do that? It's just string or I guess. Yeah. Say that again. String or QT numbers. Yeah. Right. So one way to actually. 
actually represent it as a string, right? Right. So we represent it as like A, or we represent it as S, or uh, ID in that other case. Right. Can I use an E now? How many elements am I going to need in my enum? Four. Four? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Got it. Uh, wait, wait. Four? I'm thinking of the token. Right. So, how am I going to know how many? Right, an enum is you have to specify a compile time, right? You have to specify all the things, right? So if I have an enum that says decal id list one id list, right? I don't know what the input is. It has to work for any sized input, so I can't dynamically create an enum. Uh, but what is an enum under under the hood? Yeah. So could we represent them as integers? Sure. Yeah. Does that make comparison a little bit easier? So uh, this is actually how I suggest trying to think about it is represent, give each symbol a number, right? And you can have the, in your tokens or symbols or however you want to do this here, right? You can have, maybe that's the index in this, uh, the array is the bad thing, but um, it's not a bad thing, but uh, you don't know how many elements there are going to be in this array, so it should be a vector, so maybe I'll do it like this. A vector or a list or linked list, right? So let's say I have like this, and I have a B, right? And so this is at index zero, one, two, three. So if I represent my symbols as numbers, well, I can always look them up to get the to get the string representation, right? But as far as to our computation, we don't care if they're strings or integers, as long as we can tell if they're equal or not, right? And doing a lot of string comparison <coughs> operators gets very clunky very quickly and is an excellent source of errors and problems in your code. Um, but using integers is a lot easier. You can compare integers, right? You can see if they're uh, see if they're useful or good, or uh, not useful or good, but um, because you'll have to, right? So this, and so actually, Looking at this, right? What's the difference between terminals and non-terminals? It's like they're it's just like one bit of information, right? I mean, it's either a terminal or non-terminal, but there's nothing really different about them. They are all symbols, right? So you could actually put this in a list of symbols, right, and have everything in that list be. I'm going to kind of do it as a tuple, but uh, you could define a struct that is, hey, here's the string representation, and here's, and this is a non-terminal, right? This you could use an enum for. So you have, so what kind of symbols do we have in grammars generally? Non-terminals? Terminals? Not, it's not actually part of the grammar, right? Epsilon. Yeah, we have epsilon. And then maybe we can add end of file in here too, right? So these could be different types of symbols. Um, so this is what you got to start thinking about. You've got to start planning. Okay, how am I going to do this? How am I going to represent? If you represent these data structures in a way that's very clear, then performing computation on them, you couldn't write a function called something like, I don't know, calc uh, first sets, right, that takes in a context, oh, that's a weird, a context-free grammar, C, right, and returns, uh, yeah, like, well, it's going to return all first sets, right, first set, something, yeah, list of sets. You can write a function that does this. So for any context-free grammar, you have the data structure. You know how to iterate over that data structure. You 
you know how to get all the rules from this convex tree grammar. You know how to look up for every symbol in the grammar with the left hand side uh, what the uh, symbol means as if it's a terminal, non terminal, epsilon. And then you can apply the rules correctly. Yeah. Uh, assuming we have to create these lists, data structures, and set data structures, and so on from scratch. No, no, no. So you can use. Standard library? Yes. Yeah. So all the restrictions on Project 2 are lifted. So you oh. can use uh, whatever data structures you want. But you should be, you know, when you use something like a vector class or something, right, you should know how does it do equality or a set class, right? How does it do e test equality? Especially if you're using strings as a representation, right, it defaults to usually double equals if you're using a pair uh, star. Uh, so you have to be, you are in charge of making sure that it actually works correctly as a set. I guess we'll stop here. Uh, so yeah, so I think this is probably all we'll really go over in depth like this in Project 3. Uh, but we can definitely talk about questions and that kind of stuff during class. I'm totally open to that as we go forward. Uh, we should really start planning out how you're going to do this. We'll start reading through the description multiple times. Uh, yeah. what, what should we be looking at turnaround time for the midterm? When are we going to get our grades for Project 1? Very soon. Very soon. Especially for you. So I actually don't have a remote. So it's just on the website. Uh, shoot, I don't think it's. I'm not signed in here. Yeah, I know. I know where to get it from. I just don't know how to, to run it. Oh, you have to. Um, I guess you might have had an example. I just didn't know. Interesting. It's not here. I thought it would be. Um, we'll have to find it. But yeah, the idea is uh, you. We well, have to put it on your sent OS. It'll only work on. Send OS is where you should be testing it. Either yeah. sent OS or on. Now I'm running it on the Mac. But, uh, the idea is you need to first make it usually executable. Okay. Um, uh, which is chmod plus x. To plus x means to be executable. Uh, okay. I didn't do it correctly. Yeah. And then you can just run it like that. Test uh, dot slash the name of the program and just run it. So what it's trying to do is trying to run a dot out. Okay. A dot but out. there is no a dot out okay. in here. So you just put all your code and everything in here. Run it, and it gives you a whole report of. Hey, this is what I thought should happen. This is what didn't happen. Um, why is it? So it's chmod plus x, and then the name of that thing makes it executable, yes. and you just run it. Like I believe. Oh wait, here. I believe it's in the programming <laughs> on the class home. I believe in the project guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yes, in here there is. I think the test. Thought it was in here somewhere. Well, that's enough to go on. It's it's already. Yeah, but yeah, you, and this is the kind of stuff like you can totally talk as much as you want on the mailing list about like how to do this and how to sure. set it up and all that stuff. So okay, thank you. Cool. All right, so wanted to get a sort of like overview of how my logic was working. Mm -hmm. How I was thinking about doing some of the stuff with project. Mm -hmm. So this is just one way. It doesn't have to necessarily be this if I was going to do it. But say I had like an array of linked lists. And each one was this. Each linked list described uh, one of these mm -hmm. right here. So then, therefore, if I had all these in a linked list, and say like you're, I had like four rules, or even for the first, of like the four rules that you're using to apply on these um, grammar descriptions. Is that right? Is that how you describe these grammar descriptions? Uh, rules of a context-free grammar. Rules of context-free grammar. Yes. Okay. So therefore, you could you could like look at this. And then, so if you want, this is like the S equivalent here. Mm -hmm. This is the starting one. You go over it's the starting one because it's here, not yeah. because it's necessarily there. Yes. Yes. Okay. So then I'd look at ID list, follow the rules. So I'd like the rules programmed in, so the rules would apply on each linked list. Does that so that make sense? Like. Yes. So you basically so like looking at it at this level, right? <laughs> so when you um, apply first and follow sets, mm -hmm. you're gonna go through create empty first sets for all the non-terminals yeah. in your grammar. 
right? Then you mm -hmm. loop over the rules and say, okay, for all of the rules yes. in my context-free grammar, mm -hmm. I can apply my first set rules to them. Yes. Uh, to calculate and to update these. So I'll, these I'll have these sets. sets for each of these. For um, each of the non-terminals. Sets for each of the non-terminals, and I'll apply each of the, the four rules on each of these rules of the grammar. Yes, context -free I would advise grammar. you against <laughs> um, it's it's tempting to think of a rule as just like a rule as like uh, a list of I don't know symbols or something, right? Okay. Right. It's really easy to do that, but then you will always like I I prefer, and I think it's a good programming practice to prefer explicit over implicit. Right, so here you're implicitly saying that, let's call this uh, rule R. Okay. You're implicitly saying that rule zero is always the left hand side. Yes. All right, and R1 through N, right, is the right hand side. Yeah. Essentially. I totally think you're going to be better off if you make it explicit and make a struct that is a right hand side and a left hand side that's a, that is a list. Right, just if you do that little bit of separation, okay. then when you're reading your code, you don't have to look at it and be like, okay, I have this rule, and I take rule zero, and I get the first set of, yeah. look up first set of rule zero, and then I'm gonna calculate like the first one of R1, because like it gets really confusing to think about all those things. So how are you saying you like correlate the link, the list to what, like the struct you said? Like how, how are you correlating these two like together? So I would, uh, I would think of a rule as, like a um, a left hand, sorry, well, cursive. Uh, left hand side, like let's call it a symbol. Okay. We'll use like an abstract type, <laughs> right? And then a list. Mm. So a struct uh, rule, struct called rule, where it has a symbol like a character followed by a list in it. Not necessarily a character, but yeah, because you have to define what these symbols yeah. is. But yeah, so I would do, honestly, I would do them as integers in a rule, and then uh, each of these integers would index to another data structure that tells you exactly what the representation and what the type is and everything like that. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you do something like this, right, now your rule is, so in your CFG, okay. you have a essentially a list of rules, like the rule structures, and these are your rules, Yeah. right? So this, you can iterate over all of them and you know all the left-hand side ones. It just makes it so much more clear to break it up like this and to, it's kind of like, it, it's like, kind of like commenting your code, but commenting your data structures. <laughs> okay. Because like, by doing it like this, right, you're commenting that I will always have something called the left-hand side. And the, I will have a list of things on the right hand side. Okay, when we're saying rule here. It's all, this is just in reference to the context-free grammar rules, not yes. the rules that we're applying. Not first set of first set rules. Yes, this okay. is just data structure yeah. context-free grammar rules. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. So, but uh, so, so once you have this data structure mm -hmm. in place, then you could apply yeah. the rules of the first set yep. to each of the list of like, yep. uh, values. Exactly. But ha my question is then: so if you're applying these lists, uh, these rules of the first sets. To your list of rules for the context free grammar, mm -hmm. you can do all that how I see without ever using this. How does this come into play? You have to read in the grammar. So, yeah, you can read in the grammar from the input, but it's just, you can just do like a, a while loop that does like until you see a double hash, and based on the like double hash and yeah. arrow, it just puts all that in. Yeah. It just seems like really complicated to look at that wow. when it's really we're learning, easy. We're learning about how to do yeah. grammars, right? I how to parse and read input. Because it's really um, easy just to look at this, be like, oh, I can just parse that. Yeah. Which is fine. But, so this like is just saying how to do, well, this, this is, is an example of how to do this, yes, essentially. It's guaranteeing you that, that the input to your, okay. your program is only going to look like this and never look like anything different. Okay, but as I say, like, it seemed really easy to yeah. parse that. you can that, do that but, by hand. It's very simple. Yeah, that's why I was, I was, so I was confused like what this was applying. This is just telling you how it's done, though, essentially. And it's, it's the nice thing is that, yeah, I mean, it's the grammars that we've been talking about. So we're saying, okay, yeah. the input to your program is from a grammar, and here's the grammar, yeah. and here are the tokens in that grammar. When yeah, we could just easily give you the input and say it's going to look like this, <laughs> I but see like so that you can start making that link between the two and saying like, mm. oh yeah, there is like a formal grammar for this that you could okay. calculate on and do stuff with and write a part, write a parser for it. So um, you can also easily do it by hand. So this is saying, if I understand it right, that you're going to be giving like a, a starting symbol s or a starting non-terminal s. Is that what that's? Mm. Think about it at a high level. So all of your input's going to be derived from s. 
Okay. That's what this so is. So I was saying all the inputs, all the non terminals are going to be derived from. Uh, how, how do you say that exactly? So it's all of your input is going to be strings derived from S. It has nothing okay. to do with terminals, non terminals, or anything at this point. This just says what the input is going to look like in terms of tokens. Okay. So this is saying, okay, you're going to have always a non terminal list followed okay. by a rule list followed, followed by, by a double, double hash. hash. That's the outline for our inputs, yes. which is and given. Then it, there. Exactly. Okay. And then this says, okay, so what is a non-terminal list? Well, a non-terminal list mm. is an ID list followed by a hash. ID What's list. an ID list? Right? An ID list is an okay. ID followed by an ID list or an ID, which means it's at okay. least one ID and there could be any number of IDs. Okay. Gotcha. So that's like, it's concatenated, it's like a dot there, essentially. Because the ID list followed by... Uh, no list. dots, because it's context-free grammar. So, dots are only on so how is this, what's, that, what's this saying right here? ID followed by ID list, so it's like yes. another ID followed by... The same thing. A recursive... Exactly. Okay, yes. call to it, okay. Okay. And in this case, mm, ID is represented as a letter, a letter, or a digit, mm -hmm. but that doesn't really get... How's that, like, I get that's the definition of what's going on here, but how's that being applied? Like, is it just, I don't really get what's, the, what, what's this information telling us, is it? Essentially? How to read in the input. How to read in the input. Yeah. Okay. How do you know if an ID is correctly an ID? Okay. Or how, like, so this is telling you what it looks, like, what it looks like, and this tells you precisely what is the input made of. Okay. I was just trying to see how that applied to like a formal definition, an example like that, essentially. Like, how am I applying? Well, it's how you can tell and look at this and say, okay, I know that that's an ID, that's an arrow, that's a hash, that's a double hash. You okay. know that because they're defined here. Okay. Because we can define those symbols differently, yeah. this grammar would still be the same, but the actual strings would look different. Yeah. I mean, it made sense for these three. I was just confused at how that ID was really being used. I get like it's an ID, therefore it's a terminal. Mm -hmm. But like you can see, none of them starts with a number, right? Or a digit. Comma, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's okay. how you know they're actually an ID and they conform to uh, this grammar. Okay. Yeah. All right, I think you've answered all my questions really well. Sorry for uh, oh, piling them on here. I was gonna ask you a question about project two, but I'm not sure if I could um, think of the right way to ask it. But I'm just gonna tell okay. you, my request was denied temporarily. I think they think I'm not, like, I haven't showed up to class for the past month. Oh. So I'm, well, I'm don't... gonna have to, like, um, can I come back to your office sometime today and just have yeah. you, like, write an explanation? Yeah. What time's good for you? Uh, anytime after two. Okay. Well, I the... Yeah. If you, I think if you can just uh, email me and then I can write, like, a email that you should be able to forward to advising. Yes. So that should be they just, just wanted me to, like, write up, like, my, um, for example, like, why I had to add to class so late. Mm -hmm. and, um, That's fine. Then like a plan to catch up, but I don't think they realize you, I'm like 100. percent Yeah, exactly. Behind, so. You're not you're not at all behind, so that yeah. should be fine. Okay, cool. Thank you. Question? Yeah, I get confused on this part. Okay. Nope. What about Why what does that work? About what? I get to be more specific. I I don't remember. I'll, I'll look at it again. When you were explaining it, I I didn't understand how the ID token worked. It, it, it's fine. I get. No, no, that's fine. That's cool. We can go over it. I just uh, I need just a little bit more to go on. Yeah, I. Otherwise, I'll talk forever. Let me look at this grammar used to read the grammar. When you mentioned that, I I got confused. How you're using the grammar to read the grammar? Yeah, so we're we're defining this grammar description, right? This I get is a context-free grammar that defines the input to our program. This is a context-free grammar, just like we've been studying, just like we've been looking at. Yeah, I guess this word context-free is confusing me. I don't know why. I don't understand it. I, I hear it, but it's not registering anything for me. Okay. Maybe um, the maybe context-free. I mean, this is what we've been studying. I, I understand. <laughs> I understand um, it when I'm looking at it. Maybe it's just the it's, terminology. It's just the name. It's just that's all it is. It's, it's the name. So uh, there are other types of grammars. We are specifically studying and looking at context-free grammars. Context-free means no meaning? No, no, no. It means um, the specifics of what it means is that these derivations are no, these not the derivations. These define definitions for the grammar? No, no, just a second. These rules, right? 
These rules say whenever you have an S or whenever you have an ID list, you can always replace it by either one of these two. It means that... I get that. No, no, I, I'm explaining. So, right, this is what these rules mean. You know, you know exactly what they mean. The context-free means it doesn't matter where ID list appears, right? This doesn't say, hey, if you see an ID list, uh, if you see... Like in the goes, order? No, no, the, it's not the order. So the idea is if I have S goes to A or B, right? I know wherever I see an S, I can always either turn it into an A or I can turn it into a B, mm -hmm. right? So there's how I decide which one or uh, yeah. it doesn't depend on the context of S is the, is the basic idea. So the idea would be, let's say... Um, but context of S, I don't understand because I'm, S is just I'm, S. I'm explaining to you. Uh, B, A. B, I don't know. I'm running out of C, D or something like that. Right? So this would be a different way to write that. We've never looked at any kind of grammar like this. Right? But this would say, hey, if you have an A before big A, then you have to choose this rule. Otherwise, if you have a B before big A, you have to choose this rule. So this would be a, uh, I, I don't know if it's like a- Non-context. Exactly, yes, like maybe sensitive. <laughs> Non-context. Like a context-sensitive context grammar, yeah. So it depends on the context of A, where it's being used in the string and what came before it. Uh, yes, yeah, which we don't go into, we don't touch at all in this class because we're only focusing on context-free grammars. Okay. And it's just because it makes it more complicated. So that's why we don't, I mean, right, that's yeah. not why we don't do now it. I, now I get the yeah. gif of yeah. what so that's about. It, you shouldn't worry that you don't know exactly what that term means because we haven't really defined it. In but now sense. I get an idea. Okay. Good. I don't, I, for some reason it wasn't clicking in that. We covered it very briefly. Um, so that's totally fine. All right. So the idea here is this is our input grammar to our program. Mm -hmm. These are all the strings. This describes all the strings that our program is going to accept, right? And it's written in a context-free grammar. So there's obviously a little bit of difference here than what we've normally been doing, right? So normally uppercase letters were non-terminals and lowercase letters were terminals. Here, all uppercase are terminals and everything else is a non-terminal. Okay. But this describes all the strings that this language could possibly generate. Um, so this just means, hey, so if you look at it just like a mechanical way, right, this describes how your program should be reading in input, right? But this, excuse me. I thought that describes what the, what the inputs actually mean. No, this grammar description only oh, right. describes yeah, yes. how they look. Yes, yes, I guess. I how they look, exactly. The semantics describe what does it mean. Right? What we're actually reading in is itself a context-free grammar. So this context-free grammar describes how to describe context-free grammars into our program. Yeah, this is like the, the, the map of it, the general. Mm -hmm. And then the semantics give the explanations for each one. Yes, they describe, okay, what does it mean for an ID to be in a non-terminal list? And what does it mean for a rule list with an ID in the, air, like in the right hand side? Um, okay, so that's just more definitions. Yeah, like you, and it's stuff you need to know to know how do I convert this into my context-free grammar that I can actually compute on. That's kind of cool because it's more stuff bundled, but yet simplified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's this is like we're reading like what we're reading in is described in a context-free grammar, and the thing that we're reading in are context-free grammars. So you could actually input this grammar into our program. It would obviously have to write it differently. We could input that grammar into our program to do first and follow sets of this, which would be a cool test. Okay. Yeah. Like you said, I have to read this over and over because for some reason I, I get what we did in class, but, mm -hmm. but I'm not connecting to this that well. Cool. Yeah, I mean, you, you just have to... So basically, your... Uh, up till now, we've been doing first and follow sets by hand. So you're going to write a program to automate first and follow sets. Yeah, and I thought that that I understood it by hand. I was like, oh, it shouldn't be too hard to write a program. But now I it looks like I'm getting kind it's, of. It's it's uh, it's one of those things. It's not. 
intrinsically hard, like fundamentally, like really hard, uh, but you have to do everything from scratch, right? So you have to make sure you're reading in the input properly. You have to make sure that you're reading in the context-free grammar correctly. You have to make sure you're representing that grammar correctly in a way that you can calculate first and follow sets on it. There's a lot of room for places to mess up here, right? You can mess up at the very tiny, small detail level, and yeah. you can mess up at a high level, like design structure level. So how do we prevent that from happening? You like, have to start early and design it. Design it. Well, you were giving him some advice about how mm -hmm. you should write it that it, I don't know, you were just, just describing it a minute ago that it, um, yeah, I mean, we talked about how to do, is, is basically uh, following up on things we talked about in class, like how to define uh, the rules, like at a, at a very low level, right? Like how do you represent a rule in our context, in a context-free grammar, right? So we talked about, well, maybe you could do it with like a left-hand side. Like we know that every rule has a left-hand side, which is a grammar symbol, and it has a right-hand side, which is a list of symbols. Okay. Um, so, I guess the other thing that would be nice to talk about throughout the week would be how to write it or or have the an idea of how the program should be written out so we don't get convoluted and mess things up as you go along. Because you don't want to get like 50 lines or 100 or 150 lines in and then it's written so poorly that you can't tell what you're doing anymore. Everything's getting mixed up. That is true. That's what you're going to have to do. That is kind of what I'm a little worried about. Cause yeah. I, and I don't, know if we'll take, I don't know if we'll take a lot of class time uh, anymore to do this, but uh, that's what... Maybe I'll check in the, with you. Part, or, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, exactly. That's what I mean. So these are part of uh, what office hours are for. Okay, okay. Is so you can come in, talk to me in the TA about, hey, this is the way I'm designing right. it. Do you see any problems? That kind of stuff. Like, awesome. And that's why starting early is so important. Yeah. So that if it happens where you're like, oh no, we've we've. Uh, oh yeah, if if you don't have enough time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you. So. Cool. Okay. Any other homework questions? I gotta run to my class. Cool. I'll be utilizing those topics.